The fan acceptance movement arguably has many origins. Some say it's the NAAFA in the 1960s, some say it's the rise of Tess Holiday in the mid-2010s, but one of the undeniable drivers of the modern fat activism movement stems from one book, Health at Every Size, The Surprising Truth About Your Weight by Dr. Lindo Bacon. This book was first published back in 2008, and it was a huge success. And it's part of the reason you'll hear many fat activists to this day using the phrase health at every size or haze to reference how they can in fact be obese and healthy. But in the past month, Lindo Bacon, one of the founders of the fat activism movement, was publicly dragged out of the movement they helped create. How did one of the faces of fat acceptance get publicly shamed out of it? All the drama started when one prominent fat activist that I only know from Twitter with their name as Mikey, made a public post on their Patreon called, I will never work with you. Some of the intro reads, to put it simply, even in matters of fat, the thinnest and whitest people, often under the guise of allyship, have benefited the most, socially, personally, and professionally. This has given thin allies a ridiculous amount of leeway to be, frankly, fucking horrible to fat people over the decades that this movement has spanned, as well as given them a certain cushion to protect them from being criticized for their gross conduct. What spurred me to make this post is that I had a series of interactions with someone, Lindo Bacon, who was the subject of this post, that was so ridiculously transparent in its disrespect and paternalism towards fat people and the stakes of fat activism that I felt the potential consequences of not saying something were much worse than saying something. This article is very long, and it outlines multiple interactions Mikey had with Lindo over the span of what I believe was a few months. The context this first conversation Mikey outlines is that Lindo approached them to be a co-author on the next edition of the Hayes book. This entire conversation is also incredibly difficult to read because it was written like a stream of consciousness, so I'm going to paraphrase a lot of what was said in it. Lindo said, I have a feeling that we might be compatible in that way, but the main reason I want to call this person a co-author is because I really want to make sure they have an investment in the book. You would only want to put your name on something that you are 100% behind. Mikey responds, yeah. Lindo, I don't want you to create things for me. I want to make sure this book represents you as well as me. Lindo stated earlier in the conversation that they wanted a wider range of perspectives on the book and that Mikey would be a good person to provide those perspectives. But during this conversation, they both realized that there was a wide difference in the direction of this book between Mikey and Lindo because Lindo wanted to keep large chunks of the original Health at Every Size book, but Mikey wanted to make more changes. In this exchange, Lindo says, so again, I think there's a lot I want to be able to keep in this book. This is not a new book. This is a revision of an old book, which is important because if we did it as a new book, we wouldn't be able to capture all the people who are already devotees of the first book. Mikey replied, so here's where my hesitation comes from. As we've spoken about, there is a lot about the Hayes paradigm that needs to be revised, like a lot. I have very specialized expertise that Hayes needs, that the book that is rewritten will need. And if I'm remembering the original Hayes book correctly, the revision in my head that I would be okay with putting my name on is drastically different. Lindo replies, okay, maybe this isn't going to work out. Mikey replies, yeah, I don't think this is. And Lindo says, there's no way I'm writing a new book. So they both had very different perspectives on what this book would look like. Mikey didn't want their name on a Hayes book that didn't have sweeping changes, and Lindo didn't want to change the book nearly as much as Mikey did. Strictly speaking, they just had structurally different creative visions for this book. But then they get on to talking about the role of thin white people in the fat liberation movement. It would be easy to get writers that could give me that experience, but I also want someone to be the public face. We need to bring marginalized voices to the forefront. I find it very difficult to figure out, like, I want to step back, but it's not always necessary for me to step back in order for other people to come forward, you know? Mikey replied, is that true? Lindo said, in my mind, yeah, it's true. Mikey replied, can you speak more on that for me? Because I disagree on a fundamental level. Lindo replied, because I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to how you're going to define power. Like power is not a limited resource that you either have or you don't have, that there's a certain amount and it gets divided up. Look at how power can be shared. And I think it's problematic that we don't have more representation for marginalized voices. And that's a large part why the country is so fucked up. But the point is not that white people need to just give up. It's that we use the power to help, to be able to destabilize the power structure. Mikey replied, yeah, I think there are sort of levels of allyship. Like the white trader is the person who, you know, acts against the best interests of their whiteness, right? But there's not that many people working in this space. When I think about the power dynamics within those spaces and how recognition and notoriety and accolades and fame and money, etc. are divvied up among us who are doing the work, 
I don't think that it's possible for someone like you, especially who is very famous in this space, to not step back in order to make room for other people, because power is distributed in a way that it coincides with the identities we hold, the privileged identities that we hold. And it's not that power is finite and should be spread more evenly, it's that power works in a way that sticks itself to people depending on their privileged identities. And your presence in the space does have the effect of a lot of that sticking to you. So they go into this small debate about the role of thin white allies in fat liberation, with Mikey arguing that Lindo should more or less fade into the background, and Lindo saying that they should exist with a prominent voice as long as they uplift more marginalized voices in the process. The conversation continues with Lindo asking, what do you think would be best for me to do the next time NAFA calls me and asks me to do a keynote speech? And Mikey says, say no. I'm telling you, Lindo, fat people aren't asking you to speak because that would be their first choice. It's because you have accumulated the most social capital in this space. If fat people are asking you, it's because they think you are going to give them credibility. And I don't blame them for making that choice, but that doesn't justify you saying yes. And then you being the one who just happens to be the privileged person that can go for things like that. Like, it's not necessarily because of you, because they specifically picked you, because they see you as a safe, thin person, a safe, privileged person. It's just because you published your book and became the authority. And you are also a privileged person who seems to sympathize the most with their beliefs. Again, they're being held hostage. We never give other people the license to speak for ourselves when we're in good situations. Like, that's not a thing. So I would say no. And if NAFA was very intent on having you, that's a them problem to sort out not a you problem to be like, yeah, I'm going along with. Because fat people don't always make the right decisions. Like, we're being held hostage. We're doing the best we can. And Lindo replied, and my guess is NAFA would see that as a lack of support on my part. In this entire paragraph, Mikey is implying that Lindo's prominence in the fat acceptance movement is unearned, and Lindo should do their best to make themselves more scarce in the movement so that other voices can be heard, particularly more marginalized voices. All in all, I don't think there are any good or bad people in this conversation, just a differing of opinion when it comes to power structures and how the new book should be written. But all in all, nothing horrible was said by either person. So Mikey then summarizes this entire action, saying this, Lindo was disingenuous about the project having space for my ideas. They proposed the Hayes rewrite as something that necessitated a major rework of Hayes, when they were really just looking for a fat black person they could use as a pony show to point at as an example of how charitable they are with leveraging their privilege, as well as use to write complex, nuanced discussions of fatness, blackness, disability, and other axes of oppression that they could also take credit for. And when it became clear I was not willing to play the role they wanted to force me into, they pivoted to see if they could still purchase my expertise via a ghostwriting agreement that meant they could take full credit for my work without having to meet my needs as a co-author. This is on top of the fact that during the conversation, Lindo clearly articulated they have no intention of stepping out of the spotlight or relinquishing their power over the fat people they claim to advocate for, even when one of those fat people tells them very plainly that their continued hypervisibility is harmful. The reference to ghostwriting comes from a section of the conversation when they realized that they both couldn't co-author the book because of their differing opinions, but Lindo offered Mikey money to write a section of the book so they could still have their voice heard, but they wouldn't have to put their name on the book because Mikey clearly wasn't 100% behind the book. So I don't think that was an absurd thing to do on Lindo's part. So this entire interaction was spun as Lindo using Mikey as a fat black person for legitimacy instead of what by all accounts was a simple exchanging of ideas. But Lindo said multiple times that they wanted the co-author of the book to be 100% behind it, and coming to an agreement in the end that co-authoring wouldn't be a good idea due to differing opinions goes to show that Lindo seemed to have meant that. If they were just trying to use Mikey, they probably would have pushed the issue to get their token fat black person instead of respecting the difference in opinion and accepting that this collaboration just wouldn't work. Mikey also said, it became clear I was not willing to play the role they wanted to force me into. There was nothing in this interaction that suggested Lindo tried to force anything. Once they realized that both of them couldn't be creatively satisfied with a collaboration, they quickly gave up. This statement is such a huge misrepresentation of what happened in this dialogue. So then over the next few weeks or months, Lindo sent Mikey two more emails in which they talked a little bit more about this discussion they had had, and then offered Mikey the opportunity to collaborate on another project with them during NAFA Ally Week. This second email asked if Mikey wanted to be part of a panel to discuss fat allyship. Hi Mikey, NAFA is hosting Ally Week. As part of the event, 
They would like to host a discussion that helps people see differing views on allyship and want to specifically find people who have differing opinions, one an ally and the other fat. Without revealing your name, I told the chair I recently came up against this with a fat activist and could ask if they'd be open to participating. Want to do it? The deadline is tight. NAFA would at least like to know if you'd be interested by the end of the day Wednesday. And Mikey's response to this in the article was, After rereading this email for this post, the rage came flooding back all at once. I never responded to any of Lindo's emails or messages after our first meeting. It is unlikely that I ever will. The reason for that is simple. How does one explain to a grown-ass adult that continuing to oppose collaborations to no response is, in fact, an answer? How do you explain to someone intent on making a spectacle of their self-awareness that they, in fact, have their head in their ass? And, most relevantly, how do you explain these very basic things to someone who doesn't actually care? That they are very clearly ignoring a very clear boundary because they are far more concerned with turning a no into a yes. How do you tell someone who doesn't recognize your humanity to treat you with basic dignity and respect? This statement is so disingenuous and honestly infuriating. First of all, you didn't respond to a single email that Lindo had previously sent. That doesn't constitute setting a boundary. People lose emails all the time. So Lindo sending you this second email wasn't them crossing a boundary. Second, this whole they're trying to turn a no into a yes doesn't even make sense. The no Mikey originally gave was for the book Lindo was co-authoring. This offer in this email was for a completely different event. You never said no to this offer, and you also never clearly stated that you didn't want any collaboration with Lindo ever. And from my outside perspective, it seems like Lindo was trying to help you out professionally by providing this opportunity for you and showing respect for your differing opinion, because the panel on allyship would have been directly related to the conversation you had previously had. So they wanted your voice to be heard. And this entire very long article ends with Mikey sending an email to NAFA in response to Lindo's offer, basically saying that they are a performative ally and that NAFA shouldn't work with them anymore. And it ends with, in fat solidarity, Mikey. So this is the article that set off the Lindo Bacon drama. The other flashpoint of this drama came on April 10th, when the AHDAH, Association for Size, Diversity, and Health, came out with a statement entitled, Holding Lindo Bacon Accountable. And this article is even more wild than the last one. So the entire article shows email correspondence between Lindo and a representative of the organization. The first email is long, but I have to read all of it for any of this to make sense. Hi. As you know, it's disturbing to me, and perhaps to you, that my book entitled Hayes is sometimes people's first introduction into Hayes, though it introduces an antiquated version of Hayes. As I wrote on my website, as proud as I am of this book, I'm also aware of its shortcomings, including some of the ways it transmits my unexamined privilege and does damage. I would like to write an updated 15th anniversary version to be published in 2023, so that I don't continue to do this damage and I'm able to put on a more modern perspective. Before I dive into this project, I want to run it by you. I want to know if there are any concerns or anything you would like to discuss. It's important to me to include acknowledgements, as I did in my previous book, and it's not a definitive version of Hayes, and that I'm not the founder of Hayes. I think the earlier editions were quite successful at getting Hayes on the map, and the next edition would further that, and also serve to bring attention to the organization and expand the organization's reach. Perhaps the organization would consider writing a foreword, though I don't need a commitment at this point. The concept of health at every size has a long history that predates me and includes many diverse viewpoints. I am grateful to the pioneers who helped us envision the possibilities of a paradigm shift and to the many other freedom fighters who continue to conceptualize and grow the movement to this day. Do you have any thoughts about me going forward on this project? I am happy to discuss anything and available by email or Zoom. Lindo then got a response about two weeks later that said, First of all, I'm so appreciative of the work that you have done to put health at every size on the map. Your book, which I first learned about over a decade ago during grad school, was my first introduction to Hayes. Despite its limited perspective and shortcomings, your book had a profound impact on my personal and professional life. Since my first introduction to Hayes, my own understanding, fat politics, and social justice praxis have grown and evolved immensely. I'm sure yours has too. And so my questions to you are, as an ally or accomplice of social justice movements, have you considered passing this opportunity along to any of the BIPOC, fat, disabled, lower socioeconomic status, etc. folks who are doing this work and whose voices need to be centered and uplifted? Have you considered just letting that first Hayes book go out of print publication so that new voices who are deeply impacted by fat hatred could be ushered in? 
Had you considered the other ways you could give some of your privilege and power in order to create a more equitable and just movement? If you write this book, regardless of updating it in a modern perspective, you will be perpetuating harm by centering the experience and perspectives of a relatively affluent, thin, straight-sized white person. Sharing this singular perspective of Hayes at this moment in history will drown out the voices of those with lived experiences of being fat, black, indigenous, Latinx, disabled, etc. Their voices are divergent viewpoints the world needs to hear. Additionally, if you write this book, it may bring attention to the organization, but I doubt it will expand the reach to communities and the people who want to be the center of our work. The organization and the larger Health at Every Size movement historically has been and currently is overwhelmingly white, thin, affluent, and otherwise privileged. If the organization is to survive and thrive, to be a leader in this social justice movement, we cannot have more of the same. I look forward to getting the team's feedback and discussing this with you further. Thank you, Veronica. Honestly, the nerve of some people. This entire email was basically saying, we don't think you should write this book and you should give the opportunity to someone else. But first of all, publishing deals don't work like that. Lindo wrote the book. They can't just give the rights to write another edition of the book to someone else. That's not how it works. And second of all, how disrespectful is it to treat someone who, by your own account, put your movement on the map like they should just fade into the background? Sure, you could have some criticisms about how prominent they are, but to tell them that they should just let their book go out of print because they take up too much space seems incredibly disrespectful. Especially when they are offering to rewrite the book with a wider range of perspectives, which is exactly what the organization claims they want. Lindo then responds to this email a week later saying, Sorry it's taken so long to respond to your email. I'm glad my first book was meaningful for you. The rest of your email did not land well. I'm going to take a pass on responding to your questions or engaging. I wrote my initial emails to get more information so I could make the most reasonable and respectful decision, and I did get what I needed from your response. Thanks. I look forward to hearing your opinion from the board as well. Lindo. So the organization didn't respond to any of Lindo's other emails for the next five months. Okay, this email was sent October 7th, and the next response Lindo gets is at the beginning of March. So they waited literally four months to respond to Lindo again, but Lindo sent multiple emails in that time. Lindo sent a follow-up email on October 20th and said, Hope your week is going well. You had written previously, I look forward to getting the team's feedback and discussing this with you further. Do you have a sense of when that might happen? I need to move forward in making decision, and my publisher needs this too. Fast forward a week later, Lindo sent, I'm meeting with my publisher on Tuesday to discuss the possibility of a new edition of the book. Please let leadership know that if anyone has any feedback that it may be helpful for me to discuss with my team. I encourage them to get in touch. Thanks. Lindo. Lindo sends another email in January saying, no response necessary. I get frequent requests for interviews and speaking gigs and often try to refer them out to others. Today I got a request that I thought might be a good match for you. It's a prominent podcast and might be a good op to the world about the organization and the work that you do. Basically this entire email was Lindo saying, if you need help getting speaking gigs or into podcasts, et cetera, et cetera, I can help you. Just give me this information. So then finally, the organization responds on March Fourth and says, Hi Lindo, thank you for your patience in awaiting a response. I'm currently not taking personal business media requests, but I and other folks on the team would be happy to speak on behalf of the organization in print, interview, podcast, videos, and speaking gigs. Thank you for your consideration, Veronica. Then on March 8th, Lindo gets sent this email. Please find the attached leadership team's response regarding a revised Health at Every Size book. All future correspondence should be sent to me directly. To Lindo, in your initial email correspondence with Veronica, you wrote, I would like to write an updated version of the Hayes book to be published in 2023 so that I don't continue to do this damage and I'm able to put out a more modern perspective. The organization's leadership stands behind Veronica's thoughtful response that publishing an updated version would do harm and damage to the community by continuing to center thin, white voices in the movement. The organization's leadership does not approve of or agree with you moving forward with this project. We at the organization, the holder and protector of the Health at Every Size and Hayes trademark, are committed to promoting an inclusive vision of Health at Every Size, which centers those most marginalized and harmed by fat phobia and the healthcare system. Your authorship of a revised Health at Every Size book will cause confusion with the organization's work promoting Health at Every Size. A Health at Every Size book will be reasonably interpreted as the organization's opinions, violating our trademark. 
In addition to the potential harm of publishing a Hayes book, we would like to address the harm that has already been done in your interactions with Veronica, the leadership team, and the community at large. At the organization, we're interrogating how white supremacy culture shows up in our work, organizations, and community. In your interactions with Veronica, you demonstrated white fragility, white supremacy culture, and performative allyship. We invite you to this brave space and to recognize that while intentions may be good, harm can and did happen. Actions that caused harm. Calling Veronica by the wrong name multiple times. Yeah, yeah, you did do that. <laughs> White fragility. You have stated that you are committed to anti-racism. Despite this, when provided earnest feedback, you have been dismissive and defensive, and you have refused to engage in generative discussion. Performative allyship. By asking for input and then summarily dismissing it, your request for feedback was performative. When you didn't get the response you wanted, expected, and believed you were owed, you went ahead as planned anyway. White supremacy culture. Sense of urgency. Not giving your expected timeline, then sending emails asking us to rush and adhere to your timeline. Power hoarding. Choosing to be complicit in the status quo of the publishing industry instead of bringing in and uplifting new voices. Fear of conflict. Dismissing the questions Veronica posed. Individualism. Taking actions if you alone have the power and responsibility to write a book on health at every size. What the f***? How are these white supremacy culture? Having a sense of urgency is not white supremacy. It's just basic professional courtesy to respond to emails within an allotted amount of time, usually a few days. This leadership team has been generous with their time, talents, and knowledge in responding to your requests with little evidence that you're willing to engage in an accountability process. If you wish to continue to engage in further conversations, we will need to do so as consultants where we are paid for our time. In closing, we are unequivocally unified in opposing a revised edition of Health at Every Size written by you. It will do harm and will not uplift the nuance and inclusive use of our trademark as intended. So at the end of the article, there's this section that asks, why didn't the organization respond sooner to Lindo's request for a leadership team decision? And the response was, if you are asking yourself this, take a moment to first consider the white supremacy thinking that leads you to question the timeline of events over the substance of the interactions. No, I won't do that. But I will question why your organization is so unprofessional that it took you five months to respond to an email. That is what I will question during this interaction, okay? Lindo did not provide a timeline in which to make this decision. This sense of urgency, not providing concrete information on their desired timeline, and not explaining why the rushing was important to them, is a tool of white supremacy culture to force an answer quickly before the responding party has time to fully reflect. Lindo sent three follow-up emails, all within the month of October, from beginning to end. That isn't a sense of urgency. That's just saying, hey, I haven't gotten a response, it's been a few weeks, do you have any new information for me? I'm pretty sure a month is more than enough time to reflect. And to imply that it's white supremacy to even expect a response within a month kind of undermines the intelligence of people of color to be like, you can't expect us as non-white people to respond to a thousand word email in less than a month. How are we gonna have time to fully reflect on all those words? During this time, we also took time to meet with our legal team, considering the consequences of our responses and actions, and writing a thoughtful letter to address the harm done. So they were meeting with lawyers during this time. So then there's the section on community accountability. In the last communication with Lindo, the team invited Lindo to a community accountability process. We asked Lindo to cover the financial costs of the labor of a facilitator and the team to engage in this process. Lindo has already cost the organization considerably financially and emotionally, taking resources away from our advocacy work in the community and causing harm to the team. Community accountability requires many things. The first thing is an existing relationship. Lindo does not have a strong relationship with any individual on the current team, nor has Lindo supported or participated in the organization's work materially or meaningfully in the recent past. Engaging in community accountability with Lindo is a risk for our leadership team, which is another reason we're asking Lindo to financially support this process. This entire section on community accountability is really sketchy. The main thing it says in these three paragraphs is we want Lindo to give us money to heal the harm, allegedly, but it all seems very coercive to say what you have to do to make up for the harm you've done is give us money because you haven't materially contributed to us a lot in the recent past, and we think you could make up for it by providing us with some money to recover from this harrowing process. To say that the only way you can get on better terms with us is to provide us with money, especially publicly, is 
very strange. Seems highly manipulative and not like a normal, reasonable request when harm is done, especially when that harm wasn't financial in nature. They'll say that a lot of financial work went into this entire interaction to begin with, but all in all, it was just responding to emails. You can't require someone pay you back because you had to respond to some emails and then meet with your legal team, which it's not their fault that you decided to get legal representation after these interactions. So that was the gist of this article. But I skipped over a section called Summary and Analysis that breaks down all the ways Lindo has done harm to the Hayes community based on this interaction, and there are some stark contradictions between what was written in this section and the first article written by Mikey that sparked this whole drama to begin with. 1. Lindo does not gather community input or help shape the discourse of future Hayes. They run their business as an individual for their benefit. This point is blindingly hypocritical. First of all, the entire email correspondence that they posted started with Lindo asking for their input on the updated version of their book, because in their own words, I am also aware of the shortcomings of the book, including some of the ways it transmits unexamined privilege and does damage. So they themselves acknowledged the shortcomings of their previous work and actively reached out to your organization to get input on improving the future discourse of Hayes. And not only that, but the original article written about Lindo by Mikey starts out with a recollection of how Lindo reached out to a self-identified fat black woman to get her perspective for the book. So on multiple instances, there is evidence that directly contradicts this point. Lindo expressed no intention of including others in authoring the book when they contacted us. Veronica's first point in her response was whether Lindo considered including other voices. Lindo dismissed Veronica's feedback, yet still used her labor to further their individual goals. This is also such a bad misrepresentation that I am almost tempted to call it a lie. First of all, this entire article was released and presumably written after Mikey's article was published, so whoever wrote it definitely knew of how Lindo sat down to talk to Mikey about co-authoring the book with them. So to say that Lindo didn't consider letting other people co-author is such a twisted way of framing what actually occurred. They're just saying in this point that Lindo didn't mention it in their first email, not that it didn't happen, because it did, and the person who wrote this almost certainly knew that. Lindo's email initially did not include elements of our goals for the organization presented at the annual meeting. These goals were then reflected in communications with Mikey, co-opting the vision and leadership of Fat Black Leader and the diverse leadership team. These two sentences are such a contradiction on their own that it makes me want to throw my computer across the room. The first sentence is meant to negatively criticize Lindo for not including the organization's goals in the email, but the second sentence negatively criticizes them for including those goals in another email, which by their own words is co-opting the organization's vision? So what do you want? Also, I don't know if I'm even reading this right because these sentences, specifically the second one, was written so poorly that I don't actually fully know what they're saying. Though Lindo knew the organization's goals for health at every size, they continue to move forward on their book instead of using their resources to support and follow the lead of fat, black, brown, disabled, transgender, and queer leaders of the organization. The summary of this point is that we told them we didn't want them to write the book, and they said they were going to do it anyway, and we don't like it. Um, it's not up to you. It's not your book. But they did ask for your input, though, and you refused to give it. Lindo continues to run HayesCommunity.com, which supports their hoarding of power in the Hayes space. This keeps community resources in Lindo's hands and diverts resources away from the organization and fat, black, and brown advocates. Lindo has not supported the organization materially besides the base annual membership fee in recent years. These points, along with the one I already referenced earlier when the organization said that they ask for financial compensation for their labor, are so manipulative. It all just makes it seem like the organization is very bitter that they don't get as much money and notoriety as Lindo does. And they are trying to, what's a legally okay way for me to put this? They are trying to forcefully convince Lindo to give them money. Essentially, we do a lot of work in this space just like Lindo does, but they make more money. So we would like our cut, please. All of this makes it seem like the organization dislikes how much money and notoriety Lindo makes off of Hayes. Super sketchy and very petty. 
The strangest thing with all this drama is how many contradictions there are between the main sources that have driven this controversy. Mikey said that Lindo reached out to her to try to co-author a book to provide a wider range of perspectives for the book, but then Mikey turned around and said it was wrong to use her specifically because she's a person of color. But when Lindo reaches out to the ASDAH to ask for their perspectives, they get angry because Lindo is white with a limited perspective and needs to give more voices to marginalized people. Is that not what they were trying to do when they asked Mikey to co-author the book? It should also be noted that in the timeline of events section in this article, they reference the release of Mikey's original article. So they absolutely knew that Mikey had been asked to co-author the book. And since these two articles have come out, a bunch of people have jumped on the Lindo Bacon hate train, writing their own think pieces about them. There are now so many articles coming out of people saying they knew Lindo was terrible all along and they're glad that Lindo's finally being exposed. And maybe in private, Lindo is a mean person. I don't know them. But from all the correspondence I've seen in all of these articles, there is nothing to suggest anywhere near the level of scorn I've seen Lindo receive. Now, up to this point in the video, it may seem like I'm defending Lindo. And in a lot of ways I am. They certainly didn't deserve all the hate they've gotten, but I also don't feel bad for them. At all, really. Lindo has spent the last decade using their credentials to give legitimacy to the extreme sides of the fat acceptance and Hayes movement. Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Bacon, and I'm devoted to creating a global transformation that focuses on body respect, not the war on weight. My work is inspired by lessons learned through three graduate degrees in weight science, including a PhD in physiology, as well as clinical and research experience. When the Hayes book was originally published back in 2008, I believe Lindo had good intentions. But somewhere along the way, it seems like they realized they could make more money using their doctorate and the label that came with it to engineer an entire movement made to spread misinformation, indoctrinate vulnerable plus-size women, while also increasing their own wealth and notoriety. So watching them be pushed out of the movement they created by the very people they helped indoctrinate and using the same backwards logic Lindo used to create this movement to begin with is not something I will mourn. In fact, I feel a bit of schadenfreude about the whole thing. But this entire situation should be worrying to the fat acceptance movement because this type of behavior in a social movement is not normal. The fat acceptance movement likes to compare itself to other groups like black rights, LGBTQ plus rights, disability rights, etc. They named their original organization NAAFA for Christ's sake. You can't tell me they weren't trying to copy the NAACP with that one. But normal activism groups don't function like this. In many groups that advocate for racial minorities, particularly black people, there have always been discussions about the role of white people when it comes to making money off of educating on minority issues. Back in 2020, the book White Fragility took off in the midst of the Black Lives Matter rallies, and the book's author, Robin D'Angelo, made a lot of money touring and giving speeches talking about the contents of her book to predominantly white audiences. She's gotten some criticism because it's unfortunate that a white woman can make so much money talking about experiences that aren't hers because people will listen to her more than the minorities whose stories she's telling. But even so, the vast majority of black advocates see her work as a net positive for the movement because they understand that even though Robin benefits off of telling black stories and black experiences, having those experiences shared with a wider audience still does benefit the movement as a whole. And this situation is almost identical to the one Lindo is being criticized for. Taking up too much space in a movement that they aren't a part of, as in, Lindo isn't fat. And while there could be some criticism to be had on this type of dynamic, if you truly believe fat activism is a valid social movement, there is no way to justify this level of vilification that Lindo has gotten for what advocates of other social movements have also done. And you can also see this type of dynamic in other groups. When it comes to racial and class disparities, some of the most seminal books written on the subject in the late 20th century came from a writer named Jonathan Kozel. He wrote many books in the 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s about class and racial disparities in the education system all over the United States. He did this as a white man from a middle-class family who is extremely well-educated. But he was never ousted from the movements he stood for for simply not being part of the demographic he was fighting for. But Lindo was. 
The entirety of this drama around Lindo can be summed up in these two points. Lindo refers frequently to their contribution of success of Hayes and the organization without equal and adequate acknowledgement of the success their book had because of already existing work of Hayes advocates and fat liberationists. Lindo continues to run HayesCommunity.com, which supports their hoarding of power in the Hayes space. This keeps resources in Lindo's hands and diverts resources away from the organization and fat, black, and brown advocates. These points make it clear that the organization is upset and the community at large is upset because Lindo and their books get more notoriety and make more money than the people in the organization do for similar work. And on top of that, Lindo isn't even fat and the organization is fed up with it. But unlike other movements that have given constructive criticism to the people that, in a lot of ways, represent the group without actually being part of the demographics they're representing, the Fat Liberation Movement did a complete 180 and decided to oust their movement's biggest ally out of what seems like sheer pettiness. And it's fascinating to watch. And what's even more crazy is to see how the amount of other people, particularly thin white people, that are piling on to the Lindo Bacon hate train in an effort to brown nose as hard as possible to the movement's leaders so they can continue grifting off of the people in the movement. These thin allies are out here virtue signaling as hard as possible while being ignorant of the fact that this thing that happened to Lindo could easily happen to them. One slip of the tongue, one bad interaction with a prominent enough fat activist, and Lindo Bacon's broken reputation will be theirs. It's quite a train wreck to watch. But after watching the whole thing, I can understand, objectively, where all this misplaced outrage comes from, or at least how it came to be. Because there are a lot of words that someone would need to read in order to truly understand everything that happened here. There have been very few, if any, videos made on all this drama, which is how people tend to consume their news. It's a lot easier than reading. So to actually understand what happened, you would have to read thousands of words. But it's the internet. Being impulsive, self-righteous, and outraged is a lot easier, and frankly a lot more fun, than doing your due diligence and reading the thousands of words needed to understand what happened with all of this Lindo Bacon drama. But like I said, I have very little sympathy for Lindo in this situation. As far as I'm concerned, they hired a bunch of people to dig their own grave and then push them in. Seems like a self-made problem to me. I hope Lindo made enough money off of all of this to kickstart their new career.